Well, we are uh, so excited about all that God is going to do for us this year. You know, we have um, moved into another year of ministry, and uh, as we are gathering for this year, we, uh, many of you know, last year our, our theme that helped frame uh, how we wanted our congregational uh, vision and life and uh, kind of preaching, teaching, formation uh, focus to be was about creating. We wanted to imagine what does it mean for all of us to take seriously that we all have been given uh, a, a impulse and a catalyst, some kind of, of gifting that allows us to create, to build, to expand, to do things that uh, really, really demonstrate God's activity in the world and in us and, and how uh, all of us are, are, are literally um, uh, 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 carrying this kind of creativity inside of us. And so we spent all last year on a creating theme and we're so um, moved as we prepare to move into 2019 to, to, to imagine another way for us to continue to realize our vision as a ministry and um, our, our, our call to create and make disciples and, and uh, facilitate this connect, grow, serve um, kind of DNA that we are uh, ever reaching to realize in all of us together. And, and so as we've been thinking and praying, it, it, it took us a couple months to arrive at a way to present our new frame for this year, but we're simply calling it igniting, um, that this is going to be the way we think about our year and that God has, ha is calling us to ignite some things inside of us that can be used for the purposes of building God's church, of expanding our reach into our communities, of strengthening and sustaining our families, and dare I even say, helping you to realize uh, the great gifts and uh, things that are inside of you. And so, you know, we, we hope that over the next month or so, myself and the pastoral team and preaching team are going to come and give you a, a lot of different uh, variations on this theme. And, and uh, our anchor text is going to come from 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I won't be preaching on that today because uh, I, I felt compelled to, to move, use our lectionary passage just to help us ground our consecration and, and our larger kind of uh, jump into this new year. But we will be spending some good time in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 3, helping us all to imagine what does it mean for us to ignite those things within us that can help create the world, the church, the family, and the self that we want to be. And uh, I don't know about you, but I'm excited about Igniting. I'm excited about the possibilities that this brings to us. And uh, you'll see these uh, wonderful um, uh, uh, concrete sprinklers or sparklers in your chairs. And, and uh, uh, we'll revisit that at the end of service. Um, but uh, I hope that you can take uh, this with you as a reminder of, of a commitment we want to make uh, to, to really ignite God's greatness within us and around us and among us. And so turn with me uh, to Isaiah chapter 60. We're going to spend a few moments there. And we have to take communion today, too. It's the first Sunday, of course, and the first opportunity we have to uh, affirm not only our, our faith, but our commitment to be in community together. Uh, and so we got a little ways to go, but we'll, we'll, we'll be as, uh, as thorough and uh, mindful of the time as, as possible. Uh, Isaiah chapter 60 is uh, a wonderful passage. Now, the first Sunday of, of, uh, of, of the, the new year, or at least 12 days after Christmas, it is in the liturgical calendar called Epiphany Sunday. It is normally called Epiphany Sunday. And, uh, you know, epiphanies are critical, critical uh, opportunities that are found within scripture and dare I say in many of our lives where a light comes on literally where God makes an appearance or makes a spiritual impact that helps you get a revelation you've not had before 
I know there are a lot of folks in here talking about I need a New Year's resolution. And I, I want to argue you may need a New Year's revelation. Amen. Yeah. You leave your resolutions aside because you're going to forget about them anyway. Mm -hmm. But how many know when you get an epiphany, when a light comes on, it'll stay with you the rest of your life? Oh, give your neighbor a high five and tell them I need an epiphany today. Amen. Well, this passage um, helps to contextualize epiphany. Usually, if I were to preach the New Testament passage, it would be telling the story of the wise men. The three kings from Orient are, you know, coming and meeting Jesus. And um, it, it, it helps us to appreciate uh, that, again, as we stated on Christmas Day, that God will meet you wherever you are. Do I have a witness in here today? Amen. That God is, God is, is sophisticated enough and, and broad enough that God can meet you wherever you are. God will meet folks in the fields. God will meet folks in the, main, in the, in the farm, in the barn. God will meet folks in your, in your office uh, while you study in the stars. God will meet folks while you're in the political spaces. God is not limited by our location. But God will meet us wherever we are and give us an epiphany. Isaiah chapter number 60 is where I'm going. What I what to say up there? Oh, loose here, Satan. Amen. It's supposed to say 60. Amen. Isaiah 60. All right. Uh, so, yeah, if you want to follow along in, in, in your own text, you can. But I, I'm just going to read uh, a couple of verses in the interest of time. Verses 1 through 2 and verses 17 through 18. The scripture says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you for darkness shall cover the earth and thick darkness the peoples but the lord somebody say but the lord but the lord, but the lord will arise upon you and god's glory will appear over you verse 17 says and i will appoint peace as your overseer and righteousness as your taskmaster Violence shall no more be heard in your land, devastation or destruction within your borders. You shall call your walls salvation and your gates praise. Lord, this is a great passage. Amen. Amen. It's the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. So we're going to spend a few moments just speaking from the topic, igniting our shine. Amen. Igniting our shine. Let's pray, God, in the name of Jesus. Bless the word that has been read for your people. We ask you to hide this word in our heart so we won't sin against you. And as I preach and teach your word, I pray that you will send an anointing that makes the preaching and the teaching easy. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. amen. I don't know if you've seen uh, this film. It's an old school film with Jack Nicholson in it called The Shining. You know, many of y'all, any folk in here that get, get a little moved in a, in a way by horror films. I'm not a horror film guy, uh, although this new film called Us that's coming out, that I got five on it. You know, you know, it's, you know it's, a, it's a horror film with the loonies in it. You know, it's like making you, giving you all these mixed messages. So I don't do horror films, but I do a few. Somebody say amen. But in Jack Nicholson's film called The Shining, it was a disturbing film that uh, has Jack Nicholson's face, if you remember, looking wild and crazed and, 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 and like he was possessed uh, with very demented kind of forces. In the backdrop of the film, uh, when you look it up and try to get a description, uh, talks about how this is about a family that heads to an isolated hotel for the winter where an evil and spiritual presence influences the father into violence. And while the psychic son of the father sees all these uh, things happening in the physical, he is also being tormented in his kind of mental state uh, by both past tragedies and anticipating future harm. And I was particularly moved um, as I and we were uh, 
kind of thinking about how to bring uh, this, this thing into our, our space, particularly as we are moving into a season of consecration and, and, w and we're dealing with the kind of larger uh, issues at hand in our world. You know, the first week of, of every year for some of us is a very difficult time. Um, because we are just coming out of holidays, which are often somewhat difficult for folks. And I know some folk in here, you know, you know, were telling me, I just can't wait for holidays to be over because I'm, I'm over it, amen. I'm ready to just get back to regular life. And then you come into the new year and you're kind of like, oh my goodness, I got to go back to real work or something, amen. I, I enjoy at least having a modified schedule if, 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 if nothing more. And, and yet, we also know that... Um, you know, I spent, uh, since last Sunday, I was uh, participating in at least three or four memorials of young people whose lives were taken. Um, ten years ago, Oscar Grant was killed here in Oakland, and uh, we were at a meeting uh, following service last week with uh, Wanda um, Johnson, uh, Oscar's uh, mother, who had not celebrated a birthday party with a party since his death. And, 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 but the way she decided to do it was to welcome and create space for dozens of other mothers and family members who lost their children to violence uh, at the hands of other community members or police officers. And so, you know, we spent the whole week, and there were multiple memorials happening throughout the whole week dealing with that pain that manifests during the first of the year. Of course, it, it is not lost upon any of us who have any antennas up in our political spaces, the kind of continued challenges we see in our larger world with the way governance continues to um, torture and problematize and otherize so many of our immigrant and undocumented <coughs> loved ones. And, and we're learning and hearing more cases of violence, random violence, and extreme violence happening, and of course, uh, many of us uh, have, have been particularly moved to uh, places of discomfort and anger and outrage with the way sexual violence against women, particularly black women, has continued to come back into our consciousness. And that's just what's happening nationally. Yeah. Uh -huh. Amen. <laughs> and I, I won't have the time to like put all your business out on the street. Amen. And talk about all of the ways that even in our own day-to-day -day lives, we have struggles that are not easily, easily dealt with or attended to. And, and so part of what I, I want to lift up with this sermon today is this struggle with the reality that when we are dealing with the greatest hardships and difficulties in our lives, we still have this sense that even with a presence of evil, as it was, say, in this movie with Jack Nicholson, we may have evil at work within our families or communities, that the presence of evil does not negate the presence of God's light. And when the promises of God continue to be rehearsed in our minds, they allow us to stand in a truth against what we see, that sickness cannot outshine God's light. Injustice cannot outshine God's glory. Hatred cannot outshine God's love. Sin cannot beat God's forgiveness and salvation. And most of all, death can never have the final say in our lives. But when we look around, it is often hard to reconcile the contradictions. It can be very difficult to think about, God, with all this shining, your light that has come, you have uh, just arrived, at least in the celebratory uh, liturgical practices of our church, uh, arrived and with peace and goodwill to everyone. But when I look around and when I look at my family, I don't see a lot of peace or goodwill. When I take a look at the way humanity interacts with one another, I don't see 
a lot of peace and goodwill. This is the gift, I believe, of Scripture because Scripture gives you and I an invitation into the continuous cyclical ways in which even in our failings, God continues to show up. And not only does God show up, God shows up with some resources in tow to help us uh, deal and, and maneuver through the hardships of our lives. As we go into this new year, I want to submit to you that this is an opportunity for us to take seriously that God intends to show up. Not just on Christmas Day, but God's coming is every day. Dare I say God's coming is every second. Every moment of our lives, God is showing up. God shows up in your marriage. God shows up with your children. God shows up when you are alone in the midnight hour. God shows up when you're sitting in your, your therapy session. God shows up at your job. God shows up while you're riding in the car. God shows up wherever you are. And the task for us is to get clear about recognizing God's presence. Because God's presence does not just come to make you feel good. Oh Amen. You may feel good with God's presence. Amen. That's, that's a wonderful, wonderful uh, gift of God's presence. But God's presence also comes to help you and I have what we need to endure and, dare I say, transform <coughs> ourselves, the environment around us, and the worst conditions we are wrestling with. I love the scriptures when they talk about uh, how God's faithfulness is new every morning. Yes. Yes. Think about that for a second. Yes. Great is the faithfulness of God. Yes. Morning by morning, new mercies yeah, right. you see. Hey. Why do you need new mercies every morning? Because you used up all the mercies yesterday. Yeah. Hallelujah. Give your neighbor a high five and tell him, I did, I did, amen. I'm, so I, I, I may have been overdraft by the time I went to bed, but God gave you what you needed for the next day. And so if you're going and if we're going to ignite this kind of a light and the shine that emanates from the light, I want to give you a couple things that I think are, will be helpful to help us begin this journey and this process into 2019. The first thing the text says is that we should arise and shine. Everybody say arise, arise. and shine. Yeah. Say it again, arise, arise and shine. Now, I love the, the verse where it says arise, shine, for your light has come. It is in the biblical text, particularly the audience that is being addressed here, Isaiah, although it is not thought that the prophet Isaiah actually wrote these words himself, but it is a collection of prophetic writings that are being uh, proclaimed to a people who have come out of bondage and exile. And they're trying to navigate a world that they do not recognize. And despair is starting to set in because they don't feel like they have a lot of allies. They know we have been set free from bondage, but are we on our own? Oh Who is here to help us? And God boldly proclaims that I am the light that has come to help animate and bring meaning and direction to your life. Hmm. And the scripture, when it says, arise, shine, your light has come, the word shine could also just be another synonym for light. And it is attempting to say that the light that has shown up in your life is actually a reflection of the light that God has brought to your life. That you are not creating the light on your own but that you are simply reflecting the light that God has shined on you. I want you to think about what kind of gift you have been given by God's light. Ooh, yeah. What kind of, 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 of blessing it is 
for you and I to move through life with the confidence that no matter where I am, God's light is shining on me. That God's light is shining in my family, in my circumstance, on this year. One of the greatest challenges you and I will find is that because we are not often aware or attuned to the light of God, we will miss it. And when we don't have God's light, we will allow the, the, the places without light to dominate our lives. And if you're like me, when, when, when it's dark and, and cold and, 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 and I'm, I'm not feeling what's going on, I can get down and stay down. I can withdraw. I can retreat. I can isolate myself. And the word of God starts off in this text by saying arise. Giving you and I a command that we ought not allow our circumstances to keep us down in the place where it attempts to put shackles around our ankles, around our neck, around our arms, around our spirit. That God wants you and I to arise. <coughs> not just because, you know, it, it, it is not a good feeling to be down, but arise because we are reflecting the light that has shined on us. As you and I move into this new year, I want to give you this first question. What are the issues that threaten to keep you from arising? And we mentioned a few of them already, that there are all kinds of challenges that are happening in our communities. And those challenges will, will, will threaten your ability to arise. <coughs> because those issues, those challenges, those disappointments, the pain, the trauma can often cause a crippling that may keep you in a place of brokenness when the light that comes is actually the pathway for you to arise. As we go into this new year, I want to compel all of us to imagine what does it mean for us to take the light of God seriously that it will ignite a path to rising from our very worst or most troubling conditions. Sometimes, as the light comes, it requires a commitment to practices that will cultivate the kind of awareness and familiarity with this light. If, 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 I, if I keep pressing on here, the second thing that I, I want to imagine is that if we're going to arise and shine, it means that we must resist the darkness. Somebody say resist the darkness. Resist the darkness. Verse 2, it says, darkness covers the earth and thick darkness the people. I, I know and, and I believe that we are living in a moment where it is easy to see the darkness of evil covering the earth and all of our people. Now, you know, I, I, I always, when I, I, I start to use the word darkness, just feel compelled to, to just reinforce that the, the way, you know, uh, racism and the word lang languages are used, that they over associate or determine darkness with the dark bodies of many of our loved ones and family members and how that darkness can often translate to the kind of vulnerability and abuse that we see rampant among us. And so I don't want us to get confused that the writer is trying to, to, to lay that kind of interpretation that there is a problem with dark bodies as it relates to what is going on in the text. I want to just acknowledge that there is evil run amok in the land. And that evil, as we see it and as we experience it, we are not absolved from the, the impact of that evil. That many of us are acutely aware that there is indeed 
a, a, a evil, a cloak and a cloud of wickedness, systemic, structurally, interpersonally, that is at work among us. Um, I, I remember writing or reading John Powell, one of my good friends, who talks about the phenomenon of the racialization of our consciousness and how often we can over-associate uh, the problems of our world to uh, people who are vulnerable, people who are the, the scapegoats in our society. And that continued process frees us from taking careful consideration of the work that must be done in us to change. Um, I, I uh, uh, was, was in Los Angeles or Palm Springs over the last day hanging out with some of the elders of the, the SNCC and Civil Rights Movement, um, people who actually were in Dr. King's inner circle, Clarence Jones, who was Dr. King's personal at attorney and, and uh, uh, speechwriter at times. But I also got a chance to hang out with Susanna Heschel, who was the, the daughter, or who is the daughter of great rabbi Abraham Heschel. And I, I pulled this quote um, because I love how Abraham Heschel uh, said very powerfully that in any free society where terrible wrongs exist, some are guilty, but all are responsible. And I begin to think about what does it mean given all that we see with darkness, the evil run amok in the land, that many of us may not be guilty personally, but all of us are responsible. It makes me wrestle with all of the many ways that we have seen the kind of disposability of the poor, of, of, of our women and children among us and how too often as a church we have been on the wrong side of addressing and owning the fixing of this evil. Hello, somebody. That often we will say, well, that's not me. I didn't personally do it. When in reality, we are called as a church and as followers of God to not be so radically individual in the way we see the world that we feel we don't have an obligation to let our light shine in the world in a way that helps to fix and heal what has been broken. If we take seriously what we've seen over the last several weeks with the killings and the shootings and, and even these, the documentaries that have been happening this week, we see that there's all kind of complicity of people who should do better and know better along the way. Amen. And that for some reason, when, when, when we get hypnotized by the magnanimity of people's position or power, we, we can swallow our tongue and, or turn the other way. Or it, they don't even have to be powerful necessarily. They can just be someone that you care deeply about. And you'll turn the other way. I remember here when the church that we were growing up in, our previous pastor uh, had engaged in um, inappropriate um, uh, activity with one of our young uh, loved ones here in the congregation. And it was a, a very difficult thing that my father and a number of the, the elders of the congregation had to remove him as our pastor. And he was a national bishop in our denomination. And there were folk who wanted to cover it all up because they felt like it would embarrass and, and we should have more, more, more grace and, and, and all this kind of thing. And, and I remember we were, you know, ear hustling because, you know, we was all like nine back then, you know. So, you know, ear hustling on your parents' conversation. You supposed to be downstairs asleep, but your ear is all the way up in the middle of the living room. Amen. Are we supposed to be playing in the back of the church, but our ear is lined up against the wall just listening to grown folk conversation. Amen. Yeah. Well, that's what we was doing. And we, I'll never forget the ways in which the people of our congregation unanimously said that if we do not stop this evil here, it will spread to more people in our congregation. I preach this often during Father's Day that we are all called to be cycle breakers. Yes, yes, yes. 
Hello, somebody. Yeah. Amen. And, 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 and of course, some of these evils uh, resonate in a deeper kind of uh, 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 outrageous way in many of our lives, and, 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 and they should. Uh, I, and also, I want you to appreciate that, that there are other kinds of issues that lead mm -hmm. us to be so complicit or silent in the ways in which we engage in relationships. Bell Hooks, in a great book that I commissioned all of you to read, The Will to Change, she says, when culture is based on a dominating model, not only will it be violent, but it will frame all relationships as power struggles. And I believe that part of what the darkness that is happening in the world is that we have allowed our relationships to be framed through domination and power rather than getting the epiphany of how Jesus came. Jesus did not come in a very powerful way. Jesus came in a very vulnerable and mutual manner, but his arrival still had the ability to turn the world right side up. Could it be that the way God is intending to show up in our lives is not with a lot of force and power, but with vulnerability and mutuality? in a way that helps you and I to turn our world right side up. When we don't wrestle with the darkness around us, we can become adjusted to it and it will create blind spots in our lives that cause us to not have the rage, holy rage, righteous indignation necessary to make radical changes. <clears throat> so one of the first questions that I think is worthy of our, of, our, of, our, of our struggling this morning as we go into this new year, are there blind spots in your life, in our life as a church, as a family, where evil can lurk and reside because we have adjusted ourselves to darkness. Man, you know, and, 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 and again, you know, I, 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 I want to believe that we don't have, you know, folk in our congregation who are, you know, abusive and, 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 and volatile and, and, and doing all these kinds of destructive things. Amen. Uh, but I want you to know that there are other blind spots that are worthy of y'all struggling with that may not rise to that kind of threshold. You know, ever been talking to someone and, and they believe that they're not yelling, but they are, you, they are just yelling something like your hair is standing up on the bed. You're like, my goodness. You know, my dad used to be like that. I'm not yelling. I'd be like, well, dad, I don't know if you whispering. <laughs> Amen. And, and we, had to, we had to have conversations because my dad, in his mind, you know, talking loud in the country, it's different than, you know, in San Francisco. You know, we, 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 we don't talk at a 10 level. So, you know, you have a blind spot, Dad, about how you talk to folk. Oh, wow. Hello, somebody. How many of you know some of us got some blind spots oh, yeah. about how we interact yeah. with ourselves, how we interact with other people? And those blind spots can easily lead to the spreading of darkness yeah. in our lives to the point where you won't even know that you are out so far because you did not deal with your blind spots. With all this happening in the world, all of these challenges, given the national conversations about sexual assault, immigrant abuse, gun violence, poverty, other social evils, this is a question, how can we, the church and our families, commit to collective responsibility? collective repentance, and collective accountability. Yeah. There's a process to healing, and it's not just starting with, I'm sorry. Okay. Right. There's a process to healing, and it's not just you talking about, I forgive you. Yeah. Sometimes you got to lead folk through a process yeah. of owning what happened, yeah. of repenting, meaning I'm going to make a commitment that I'm never going to do it again. <laughs> See, we often think repentance is saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, well, no, I mean, God bless you. I'm glad you're sorry. 
But are you going to commit to not doing it? Are you going to make a radical turn? And it's hard to make radical turns away from things if you don't even know that it's there. Because we have our blind spots. Even in church, I was watching Bill Street. Um, uh, and and uh, I don't know how many of you have seen it, but the, the, the early part of the movie, it has some holy rollers in there. You know, some of the folk I grew up with. You know, tongue talking, can quote a scripture on anything. Amen. You give them a word and they just quote a scripture on it. You know, you know man, it's, it's really cloudy outside. That's because it rains on the just. That's why. <laughs> like, what? I'm just talking about talking about the weather. Amen. You vote like that. Amen. That, that was a couple of characters in the movie. And it was so fascinating watching a caricature, a outside expression or example of folk we used to hang out with that we thought it was normal. How many know you can be in your own little kind of world and you need somebody else to kind of Look in and give you some feedback yeah. on your job. They call it a 360 review. <laughs> Somebody say amen. amen. I don't know if you, I don't like 360 reviews because I don't like nobody telling me about myself. I mean, like, I like myself. Somebody yeah. say amen. I like it just the way it is. Yeah. Then you be sitting there in your review and you're just getting all nervous and you're starting to sweat because you're like, man, they may see a part of me that I don't want to deal with. But if you don't deal with your blind spots, your blind spots will cause you to get into wrecks that will destroy not just your life, but the life of those around you. Every husband, father, man should address and wrestle with blind spots related to how we interact with our women, children, girls. We shouldn't just assume that ain't me. I'm not R. Kelly. I'm not Bill Cosby. I'm not Harvey Weinstein. I'm not all these, these predators and perverts. But the reality is, you know, how do you know if you ain't wrestle with some blind spots? I've met some folk, you know, they're not totally off the chain, but if you look at the way they interact with their loved ones, you're like, man, mm, you, 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 ain't, you ain't an abuser, but you on your way. <laughs> Hello, somebody. We have to do the work of addressing blind spots in our faith practices, in our relational dynamics, or we will create problems that spread darkness unintentionally. And in 2019, I want to believe, this is the last point, and we're going to spend a few moments in prayer, that the way we walk into the light is to engage in the practices that lead us into the light. We engage in consecration and fasting not to make ourselves feel more spiritual. We engage in these time-tested practices because for millennia, people have attested to this truth that when you intentionally move your desires out of the center of your life and intentionally place spiritual practices that feed your connection to God and creation, you begin to drive out darkness just by your faithfulness to those practices. Some folks say, oh, you know, how am I going to get rid of this? How am I going to overcome this? I tell them, just start engaging in some spiritual practices. I was, I was uh, me and my wife were talking about you know we are we we got daughters and 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 you know we they 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 love Cardi B and they love all these folk that I just don't understand. That's how I know I'm becoming old. Amen. Yeah. I'm just, just like well, what is what is this? I mean, we we don't endorse this. This is ridiculous. And I just I just want to like take a hammer like my dad used to tell me and just bash every screen out so nobody will hear about it or see about it. And, 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 and it, was, it was a fascinating thing for us to just talk about what we feed the most will have the most power over us. If we don't feed our spirit, no wonder our spirit is so weak and anemic when it comes to having to overcome the evil within us, the evil around us and the evil beyond us. Consecration is just a structured practice for you to feed your spirit that which your spirit 
is longing for. Because many of us don't know our spirit is longing for it, but we feel the emptiness. How many ever felt spiritually empty, but you, you didn't know how to feel it? You just feel, I'm, I don't have any peace right now. I'm, I'm, I'm not clear about what my next step should be. I'm struggling. Well, the consecration is opportunity for you to say to yourself, I am not going to allow my best intention but my worst impulses to sideline me for this whole year, to interrupt my sacred relationships with God, with myself with my family. No, I'm going to do some work to make sure that we are aligned with the purposes of God. Consecration helps you and I to do that. I want to invite you to see the shining of this light as a way for you to um, uh, ignite some things in you that only the spiritual power and power of God's spirit can ignite. I need, I need someone to help me because, you know, I, I don't know how to do these lighters all that well. But Erna, just, just light up one of these things for me. And, yeah, one of the sparklers. And, and I want you to imagine that the consecration is like this fire. Come on on stage. Amen. And, and, and I want you to imagine this consecration is like this fire. And you and I... is this seemingly ordinary looking stick. But there's something on this stick that when matched with the fire creates something extraordinarily compelling. You may not think there's a lot to you, but I want to argue, add some fire to it. Add some practices to it. <clears throat> Add some, some, some ways of living this, this month that will help you to see that even in your very ordinary and mundane self-description, that with a little bit of intentionality, you can shine. Your family can shine. Your calling can shine. Come on, let's stand to our feet, everyone. Close your eyes and let's just reflect for a few moments. Yeah.